Okay, so uh, today's lecture will be devoted to um, uh, orbital stability. Uh, so maybe before before diving in, let me explain what that means and how this relates to the global picture. S uh, so orbital stability means that if you start close to a soliton at, at the initial time, uh, then uh, the solution at any later time remains close, perhaps not to the soliton, but at least to the family of soliton, or to be more precise, to the orbit of the, stability of the family of solitons under uh, the, the symmetries of the equation. Okay, so that's very good, uh, but we expect more to be true. We expect locally, if the equation is set in the whole space and waves can disperse and go to infinity, what we expect is that locally you will converge to the, to the soliton. Uh, so we expect more to be true, it's only a partial result. And furthermore, I should say, uh, there are some cases where you cannot establish orbital stability, where the only type of stability that you access is, is, um, is uh, asymptotic stability. Because to establish orbital stability, as we will see, the whole trick is to cook up a functional which has uh, which, which reaches its minimum on the family of, of solitary weights. But sometimes such functionals just do not exist. Uh, solitary waves are a critical points, but not um, extremizers. And then you, you cannot use this uh, variational idea. So today uh, we will focus on the case of uh, KDV, where this idea uh, applies. And it goes back to uh, work of Benjamin in the 60s. Uh, similar things can be done for, for many uh, models in 1D, for instance, um, NLS, but, but the, the details are, are more complicated. Okay, so before uh, discussing orbital stability, I will first uh, briefly tell you why global solutions exist, right? Uh, so, global solutions. Okay, so this one is not so working so well. Right, so so the, the two models that we are interested in are NLS and KDV, or I should say generalized KDV. So here it's minus. Minus, yes. Uh, and g of u squared is f of u. Okay, so these are the two models that we're interested in. Uh, remember the conserved quantities are uh, the L2 norm that I, I call the mass. And the Hamiltonian, or the energy, right, so this we, we already discussed. Um, so the uh, function f here, we think of it as a nice function, so I, I don't write 
uh, exact hypothesis, but I, I draw a picture. So this is x, this is f, and here it looks like x to the alpha. Okay, and the, 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 the theorem is the following. If alpha, ah, okay, so this one is not working either. If alpha is less than six, uh, then NLS and KDV are globally, I'm sorry, three troublesome, okay, so I'm sorry for this uh, many colors, are globally well posed. Ah, isn't that beautiful? For data in H1. Okay, so that's the theorem. So uh, w w what this means is that, so if the power uh, alpha that governs uh, the function f f for large x is, is, is less than six, uh, then if you take data in H1, you know that you have a, a, a global solution that is unique in an appropriate uh, function space that I don't detail. And... Uh, Georg, yeah, oui, oui. Uh, do I remember correctly that uh, the case six, uh, we need more data last time? Or, or six or five? Yes, so six for the energy means five in the equation. And, yeah. and then... So we need small data with this three uh, people. Uh, That's true. So alpha equals six, which corresponds to the quintic NLS or quintic KDV, is the so-called critical case. And then if you take small data in L2, you have a global solution. If you take large data in L2, uh, blow up is possible. So perhaps you don't have a global solution, but you have a singularity that appears in finite time. And if alpha is bigger than six, uh, it's, it's even worse. So it's actually an uh, optimal statement as far as the, the power alpha goes. Okay, and, and so of course it's important to have such a theorem if we want to discuss uh, stability of solitons because, well, if the solution is not even global in time, you know, the, the, the question doesn't make sense. So that's, that's important. And I just want to explain why this sort of result is true. This is not working. All right, let me try and get another one, sorry.
Okay, so sorry about that. I hope it's not too bad. Uh, so let me explain now why you get a global solution. So how, how, how you can prove the, the theorem that I just stated. Okay, so proof. And I will do the proof for NLS. So here is the reason why. The reason is that uh, as far as KDV goes, uh, there is a so-called loss of derivative. So the nonlinearity involves one derivative. Um, and so, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it implies some, you know, technical uh, considerations, which which are not needed for for NLS. Uh, okay, so for NLS, so uh, the first step is local well posedness in H1. So in other words, if you have data in H1, why do you get a solution locally in time? Uh, so the, the key to uh, proving such a statement is to, pr to write NLS as an integral equation. So you use Duhamel's formula to write NLS as u of t is e i t dx squared u naught plus the integral between 0 and t and here you get f or g of u squared u of s ds right so that's something that we already did and what i claim is that it's it's possible from this formula to do a fixed point argument <coughs> in L infinity zero T H one. So it's the set of functions from zero T to H one, which are uniformly bounded in the H one uh, topology. So it, to be precise and clear, it's L infinity in time, H one in space. Um, so maybe just uh, one, one key word to explain why this fixed point argument is working is that H1 is an algebra in dimension one. Meaning, uh, you know, if you take two functions in H1, not only can you add them and you remain in H1, but also if you multiply them, you remain in H1. And also, if you apply a nonlinear function like g to an h1 function, you are still in h1. So, so from there, it's not hard to see that you know, if you input u in h1 in the nonlinear term, uh, the output will also be an h1 function because if u is in h1, g of u squared is in h1. If you multiply it by u, you're still in h1. You apply the group, the Schrodinger group which is unitary on H1, so nothing happens. And then you integrate in time, and what this means is that you pick up a factor t, the length of the time interval. And from there you see that, well, first, this, this space is stable, at infinity H1, by this nonlinear term. And you also see that if t is sufficiently small, then you get a contraction. So, so that's a very rough sketch, but that's, that's really what, what you do. Okay, so now we know that uh, if, if the data is in H1, you have a local solution in H1. Oh, and I should say, not only that, but the time of existence over which you can solve by a fixed point argument, the time of existence only depends on the H1 norm. So time of existence
it only depends on the H1 norm. OK, so from there, you see that what remains to be done is to get a uniform bound on uh, u of t in h1, right? So if, if u of t is uniformly bounded in h1, then you can always prolong the solution by a certain you know, minimum time of existence, which only depends on the upper bound on the h1 norm. And you, know, you can formalize this using a, a, like continuous induction or open close uh, argument. And this gives you a, a global solution. OK. So what remains to be done is to get this uniform bound. And I'm going to explain to you how it comes about. Uh, perhaps you have questions because I was a bit you know, fast and rough here. OK, so if not, let me erase. And let's see if this beautiful device is back to life. That would be great indeed. Yes. Okay. Oops. OK, so now step two is how to get a uniform bound on the norm of u of t in h1. So basically, we have two conserved quantities, the mass, remember, and the energy, or Hamiltonian, And here, this is a negative sign, sorry, negative sign. OK, so if the sign was positive instead of negative, uh, then we would be down be because the conservation of the Hamiltonian would give uh, immediately a uniform bound on the uh, h1 norm. So the h1 norm being sorry, the, uh, on the integral of dx u squared, which if you put together with the L2, uh, makes up the, the h1 norm. OK, but we have a negative sign, so you might argue. Sorry, question. Yeah. yeah. I mean, h2 underneath the integral at going to h1, uh, going to the problem, how do you handle that? Uh, right, so since you're on, on an infinite interval, you need to use the mass for low frequencies. And so maybe I should have defined uh, somewhere here, let's say. Uh, f in h1 equals f in l2 squared plus dx f in l2 squared. Oh, okay, okay, good, yeah. Okay, awesome. I just uh, stupid question, sorry. No, 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 not at all. I'm sure you know many people are wondering about no, that. I was just thinking that it's the other one, so that's why I was thinking. Okay. Oh. Uh, right. So you might argue, OK, the energy is conserved, but there might be a compensation between these two terms, which means that though h remains constant, this uh, first summon here goes to infinity. OK, so why this is not possible is due to the uh, Galliardo-Nuremberg inequality. So Galliardo-Nuremberg. Inequality. 
So named after uh, Louis Nirenberg, who, who passed away a year ago. And it says that the norm of U in LP is less than the norm of U in L2 theta dx U. OK, so you bound the norm of U in some LP, where you think of P as being large, uh, by a, a geometric mean of uh, U in L2 and dx U in L2. Right? Uh, so the, everything is tied by scaling. So you know, both uh, sides of this, equation have, uh, this inequality have a scaling. So you can easily deduce what the relation is. 1 over p is theta over 2 plus 1 minus, oh, sorry, yep. Let me erase that. Ouch. So theta minus 1 half, where uh, theta lies between uh, one and one half. So you can think of it as a way, you know, to sort of interpolate between sub OLF embedding and uh, just uh, the L2 norm, something like that. Okay, so now, now we're just going to use this uh, Gaia Don Nuremberg inequality uh, and see that the energy actually controls the H1 norm. Uh, and just for the sake of simplicity, I will replace G of U squared by U to the alpha. It's not exactly U to the alpha, but um, you know, it behaves like U to the alpha for large U, so that's, that's what matters. Okay, so from this we did use that uh, the energy H is, is uh, larger than, so, so you have this first sum end, one half integral of dx u squared, that you leave as is. And then you have the integral of, of u to the alpha, for which you use the galliard nirenberg inequality, and this gives minus u in L2 to the theta u, or dx u, in L2 to the 1 minus theta, everything to the alpha, uh, which is nothing but u in L2 to the alpha theta times u dx u in L2 to the alpha times 1 minus theta. So. Uh, the mass is conserved, so it means this term here, we think of it as a constant. This is conserved by the uh, nonlinear flow. And then you have, on the one hand, the integral of dx u squared, and on the other hand, dx u in L2 to the alpha uh, times 1 minus theta with a negative sign. So we can think of this as uh, if, if capital X is uh, the integral of dx u squared. Then this right hand side here is like x squared minus cx to the power beta. Right? And what we have is an upper bound on this quantity. So this will translate into an upper bound on x, obviously, if beta is less than 2. You need this exponent here to be less than 2. And if you do the computation, because we know how um, theta depends on p, which is alpha for us, so this is the same as alpha less than 6. OK, so I, I hope this is clear. Please, please ask if, if it's not and if you have, if you have any question. OK, so th that was like, a, okay, first, this, this guarantees us that, that we have a global solution. 
which means that the, the, the question we're asking is, uh, you know, makes sense. Uh, and second, this gives the first flavor of this, uh, you know, variational arguments that we're going to, to use. Okay, so if you don't have any questions, I'm going to erase. Okay, so now we come to the actual subject, which is orbital stability. So, okay, we will do it for KDV because it's a bit simpler. Uh, it's more simple essentially because uh, it's lower dimensional because the unknown is real valued instead of uh, complex valued for NLS, which gives rise to you know, some sort of complications, but which are mostly of a technical nature. The, uh, the very similar arguments can be applied to the case of KDV. Okay, so uh, here is the equation KDV. Okay, uh, there are uh, distinguished solutions, uh, which are the solitons, which are of the form CC of X minus CT with a C positive and CC satisfying minus CC double prime plus C CC minus F prime of CC equals zero. Okay, and these are these are traveling waves. That's PCC. Okay, so the, the theorem is the following and it's due to uh, Benjamin. Assume that D over DC Okay, so th this, this measures the L2 norm squared, so the mass of the soliton as a function of C, which is the propagation speed. And you're asking that uh, this decreases as the speed increases, okay? Uh, remark, if f of v x equals x to the alpha, this corresponds to alpha less than six. So, uh, you know, the range over which you get global solutions agrees wi with the range over which you're gonna get stability. 
Okay, so under this condition, then Cc is orbitally stable. Which means, i.e., if the data u not. Uh, question? Yes? So your condition is t over dc, right? The, yes. Do we do? Okay. Yes. Thanks. So if the data is sufficiently close to the soliton. Excuse me, sorry, just an interrupt. Uh, of course. Minus x to the 3 u of class. Uh, in the uh, uh, KDV. Sorry, sorry, once again? In the KDV, DTU minus, I think we have plus. Oh yeah, so it's it's possible that I, I switch uh, now and then. Uh, so let's let's think. Yes, no, it's you're right, you're right. Uh, so it should be for the it should be a, a minus here, say. Uh, no, that's fine. I guess I think for plus x. Uh, no, no, it it should be a minus, right? Because you want the energy. So, so what matters is that the energy should not oh, yeah. have a sign. Okay. The energy yeah, should sorry, not have sorry. a sign. But do we still have a plus with the... Um, so, you know, here I, in front of dt, you can put plus minus, it doesn't matter. Okay, and maybe I, I switch convention. It, it doesn't make a difference. And I mean the space shop, right? Sorry. Not the time. This one, Right. Yes. So, so what matters is that these two signs are the same. Because then okay. the energy is not, does not have a sign. Uh, but I might be switching uh, conventions, uh, which I should not be doing. But yeah, sometimes I'm I'm I, I'm, I'm not consistent. Okay, thanks. Uh, yes. So what I was going to say. Yes. So right. So 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 once again, uh, if you want solitons, the energy should have uh, its its kinetic and its potential terms that have opposite signs, and that's what matters. Uh, but the, the sign in front of the time derivative does, does not matter. It's just reversing time. Uh, right, so then under this condition, Cc is orbitally stable, i.e. for any epsilon, there exists delta such that if u0 minus pcc is less than delta, and this is in h1, then uh, for any time t, the infimum over x0 is less than uh, epsilon. Uh, sorry, uh, just, it's probably also doesn't matter, but in your equation of psi, the second order equation, mm -hmm. you really have a c psi prime, c? Oh yes, and this is a prime. So this does matter. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, no, is, it, is it a prime? Is it a prime? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, because it's coming from the time derivative. Uh, it's the time derivative, yes, but then you go one derivative. No, so there is no prime. I think there is no prime. So you need a prime, don't you? I think there is no prime because uh, if you take the time derivative, this gives you dx, but then you integrate once, right? So then the, you, you remove your dx. All right, so here you have two derivatives, not three. Oh, okay, so there's a... Right, so, sure. okay. yeah. Right, so actually, right, so maybe, uh, you know, you, you could also, you could also take the infimum over, uh, say, C tilde and put a tilde here. But, uh, yeah, this, this would also be, this would also be, be true. 
but uh, you know the, what, what's most problematic is if you if you change so you say if you take u naught to be psi uh, c tilde or c c prime right then both solitons will not travel at the same speed and they will depart from each other but this is completely accounted for by the uh, translation that you put here right so you don't need to do, you don't need to take the infilm over the over the uh, propagation speed. Okay, and so it's uh, orbital stability. So U remains close to the orbit of the soliton under let's see under the the symmetry the, by translation. So, sorry, I'm confused now because so uh, if you're close in H1, you're also close in an infinity, right? Yes. And so, so you're saying, but, but so these uh, solitons will, if they travel apart, then uh, shouldn't. So if they travel apart, this is this is accounted well, for they, by the translation parameter x naught, right? So you. you you're taking the infimum over all possible translations of u minus the translated soliton. And if they travel apart, they will start being big in an infinity norm, right? Yes. So that's why. So that's why you need the x naught here. Oh, okay. Good. Okay. Right, good. Okay. Sorry. I no, no. But uh, thanks for your questions. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure they're helping uh, everybody. Right. So, uh, if you know the naive type of stability would be uh, Lyapunov stability, and there would not be a translation x naught, but uh, but then uh, by you see that this, this cannot be the case because if you vary the the speed of the soliton, uh, then you know they they, they they go apart. Okay. So, uh, how do we prove that? OK, so le let's go for the proof. Uh, OK, so the basic idea is that we want to ouch, Okay, so we want to cook up a functional a functional of u such that okay, so f is invariant 
by the flow of uh, KdV. So in other words, f of u of t uh, is constant in time if u is a solution of KdV. And f of u uh, looks like a constant plus something like the infimum of uh, u minus psi c x minus x naught in L2 squared, and the infimum is over uh, x naught. Right, so if, if we had something like that, then we would be, we would be done. Uh, because, you yeah, know, that's, that's exactly, that, that would be exactly the, the conservation of f would, would be exactly the statement of the theorem. Okay, so how can we hope to cook up such a functional well, we have two conserved quantities. Uh, which are the mass, once again, and the energy. So, so I have another question. Yes. Uh, this may be very silly, but does this help as have anything to do with the other f we have the Oh yeah, maybe f is not the best way of denoting it. Uh, or let's say script f. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for this clarification. Okay, so we have two uh, conserved quantities. Uh, so, you know, the most... Uh, Naive thing to try is to, to, let's try F to be a linear combination. Alpha. Or, sorry, let me erase that. Okay, so uh, right, the, the most naive attempt is to just take f to be a linear combination, alpha m plus uh, beta h, right? So if this is to work in particular, um, right, if this is to work and if f satisfies the second hypothesis, in particular, the gradient of f at, uh, at the soliton psi c should be zero. So we want a gradient of f at psi c equals zero. Okay, so you look at what the gradient of m is. It's just, uh, so m is just the L2 norm, so it's psi c, uh, understood, you know, through duality, right? Uh, the gradient of m is the scalar product of psi c against uh, the argument. And then the gradient of h is uh, like dx squared psi c minus f prime of psi c. Right, so you see that if you want the gradient of f to be zero, uh, you, you know, you, you, you better choose alpha equals c and beta equals one. 
uh, modulo any sign error, but I think it, this is correct. No, wait a minute. Uh, here should be a minus. Right. So if you choose alpha equals C, beta equals one, you see that the linear combination of the gradients uh, gives exactly the equation satisfied by psi c, namely uh, psi c double prime, f prime psi c, and c psi c. Okay, uh, so now, you know, the, the uh, functional that, uh, the candidate that we have is f, which is the energy plus C times the mass. Okay, and the amazing thing, or at least surprising thing, is that uh, if you take this functional, uh, it's gonna satisfy uh, this, this uh, say, star star condition. Okay, so, uh, you know, of course it's due to the, the structure of the equation, uh, but it's, it's a bit of a miracle that uh, this, you know, most simple choice of the functional f actually does the job. It could very well be, so essentially what we'll do next is uh, f for this, this uh, star star condition to hold, uh, you have a condition on the, essentially the second variation of f at psi c. And the second variation of f at psi c should be a positive definite once you remove this, this symmetry by translation by taking the inf. Okay. And so we'll prove that this is the case, but a priori, uh, you know, it, it might as well be anything. Uh, you might have a number of, of negative directions, but this is, this is not what happens. Okay, it, does, it, does it make sense? Did you guys have questions before I erase? I have a, a short question on the double star uh, condition. Namely, in this infimum, you have the alpha and the beta uh, and the psi condition. Sorry, yes, it should be h1. Thank you. Okay. Yes, I have a question to you. Yes. Um, how does this, um, the gradient of M, how do you calculate this? I don't see the point. Oh. At, at psi C, I mean. Why is the gradient of M psi C? Yes. Right. Uh, so let's, let's do that here. So M, let's, let's compute M at F plus epsilon phi, right? So there is a constant term, which is f squared, then there is two epsilon f phi, then there is epsilon squared phi squared, right? And by definition, this is uh, m of f plus epsilon. So here we define the gradient by duality, so gradient m. Yeah, which part of the black body is cut, ah. so you shouldn't go all the way to the point. Yes, thank you. Okay, that's a good point. Uh, so let me go back. So this is, I guess you can see, uh, M of F, and then you define the gradient by duality, epsilon, gradient m against phi, where the, this is the L2 uh, duality, plus O of epsilon squared. Right, so if you identify terms of order epsilon, you see that the gradient is f, or two, there might be a factor two uh, lost right. somewhere. Yes, yes, okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay.
OK, so we have our functional f, f of u. So now we saw it has to be the energy plus c times the mass. Uh, and now our aim is to show that uh, f of u looks, if u is sufficiently close to the soliton, like a constant plus the infimum of u minus psi c of x minus x naught in each one squared. Uh, so essentially, uh, it, 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 the, 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 the main difficulty is to understand the second variation of f at uh, psi c. So uh, what is the second variation of f? Second variation of f. Uh, so f of u plus epsilon phi. So it's f of u plus, uh, as I was saying, epsilon the gradient, and then epsilon squared times uh, you know the, the second variation plus uh, o of epsilon cubed, right? But so um, essentially what we have to do is to look at the second variation and show that it, it works as it, as it should. Uh, so if, if you do a small computation, so it's very easy, you know, you, you, you plug u plus epsilon phi in h and m, and you expand in epsilon, and you realize that this second variation can be expressed as Uh, h sub u against phi taken at phi against phi where h sub u is minus dx squared minus f double prime of u plus c so this is a Schrodinger operator uh, taken at, at u. But so ultimately, what we really want is to look at the second variation close to psi c. So uh, we're going to denote this h sub c to be the second variation close to uh, psi c. And u is replaced by psi c. Good question. I, I might have missed this point. Uh, maybe you said it. So this constant c here, is it the same constant that you have? Is it the speed of the soliton or it's... This, this c here? Yes. Yes. It is. Yes. It is the speed of the soliton. Yes. Little c is always the speed of the soliton. Yes. Okay. The same as the soliton. Okay. So the second variation is given by the second variation taken at at psi c is given by this Schrodinger operator uh, and then uh, you know our aim is to show that this Schrodinger operator uh, will ultimately con con lead to uh, something of this form. Okay so there are, there are two problems. Okay, so first problems, first problem, sorry, is that uh, HC has a has an eigenvalue, which necessarily is negative. Okay, and second problem is you know what what's with the invariance by translation. That is, uh, in the end, what we want, we don't want to show that HC is definite positive. We want to show that this thing here is, is, is definite positive. Okay. 
Well, that's good because HC is not definite positive. It has an eigenvalue. And actually what's going to happen is that this eigenvalue will be canceled by taking the infimum over uh, translations. So both problems will be solved together. Okay, does it make sense? So now the plan is to uh, to f to fix what we're going to do is uh, we 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 we're not going to compute we're not going to to show that HC is 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 definite positive because it's not we're going to show that HC is definite positive. Uh, once you uh, imposed a certain uh, translation, I'll, 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 I will I will explain that. Sorry. That's right. Uh, no, no. The derivative of psi c is a, is a zero mode. Oh yes, that's that's a good point. So uh, HC has, I should say, a negative eigenvalue. Sorry. Uh, I'm I'm going to come to that in a second. Any other questions? Okay, so let, let's start with uh, you know two, two, two small identities. So two identities. Uh, so remember the ODE satisfied by psi c. So uh, you can do you can do two things. First, you can uh, if you differentiate with respect to to dx or to the space variable, uh, this identity. What do you obtain? Well, what you obtain is that minus p c c triple prime plus c p c c prime minus f double prime of c. I'm dropping the c uh, subscript. OK, so that's one in identity. And the second identity you, ob you obtain by differentiating 
with respect to uh, the speed of the soliton. And then I will denote uh, with a dot the corresponding, um, uh, the corresponding operation. Uh, so then what you get is minus psi c, let's do away with the c, double prime dot plus c psi dot minus f double prime of psi psi dot equals minus psi dot. Okay, so that's two identities that, you know, just follow simply from uh, differentiating the ODE. And now let's discuss the uh, spectrum of H sub C. So H sub C, recall, it's the Schrodinger operator given by, by minus dx squared plus C minus F double prime of psi C. Okay, so the first, the first thing is that uh, obviously, so it, you know, this is uh, just a one-dimensional Schrodinger operator with a rapidly decaying potential. So the, you know, the, 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 the theory is, 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 is not, so yeah, the theory is not hard. Uh, first, the essential or continuous spectrum Uh, is C infinity. Uh, second, uh, we learn from uh, uh, this point here, so the derivation with respect to X of the ODE. What this is telling us is that HC applied to psi prime equals zero. So psi prime is in the kernel of uh, HC. Okay. Um, now, uh, so psi, remember it looks like that. So that's psi. And psi prime, well, uh, it's going to look like that. So that's psi prime. So in particular, psi, psi prime has one zero. And, and then uh, we can apply a sturm liouville theory. So that's something, uh, you know, very useful for um, one dimensional Schrodinger operators is that if you know an eigenfunction, if you know an eigenmode, then the number of zeros of this eigenfunction equals the number of eigenvalues which are less than the eigenmode. So in this case, uh, C, C prime is in the kernel, so it's associated to the eigenvalue zero, and it has one zero. So uh, we know by, by Sturm Neuville that uh, there is one negative eigenvalue. So this tells us that uh, there exists a unique negative eigenvalue. But this does not tell us what this uh, negative eigenvalue is. Uh, okay, and you know, that, that's a uh, I'm, I'm assuming here a little bit of, of familiarity with uh, one-dimensional spectral theory, but these are all very basic things. So to summarize, what does the spectrum look like? So the spectrum of HC. So that's uh, the value of the spectral parameter. So here you have C. So that's the continuous spectrum. We know there are no embedded eigenvalues. So once again, it's, it's a property of you know, just any 
nice, uh, any 1D Schrodinger operator with a nice potential. So zero is an eigenvalue. So this is an eigenvalue. So there is one negative eigenvalue. Let's call it minus lambda. So that's a negative eigenvalue. And there might be possibly a couple of eigenvalues between zero and the continuous spectrum. You know. So they cannot be excluded, but they, they, we don't really care about them. Because remember, in the end, what we want to show is some sort of uh, positivity property for HC. So if there are uh, positive eigenvalues, this will not bother us, but we need to be a bit, uh, a bit careful, and even very careful, about negative eigenvalues and uh, zero modes. OK, and uh, as I was saying, uh, negative eigenvalues are, are, of course, troublesome. And, you know, it's taking advantage of this translation invariance that will enable us to uh, get rid of them. Okay. Do, do you have any questions before I erase? Well, I have a question. So uh, I'm missing the point between uh, uh, the zero modes are Idea. idea. Right. Well, so, no, no, I can give you the rough idea. By, by, by taking the, the infimum over all space translations of uh, u minus c translated, by taking the infimum, uh, it amounts to uh, imposing uh, a linear condition on u. Uh, it, it amounts on imposing that u is orthogonal to something. And, and, and therefore, uh, what we're going to have to prove is that uh, this Schrodinger operator is, is not positive on uh, all of L2 or H1, which it is not, but we'll, we'll have to show that it's positive in the orthogonal of a vector, and, and that's, that's going to be fine. So I will, I will explain that. Now, actually. Okay, I have another question. Yes. Um, Lily, on, um, so you derive these two identities, mm -hmm. and the thing when you differentiate with respect to C. Yes. So um, on the right hand side, you have this minus uh, psi dot. So yes. wh where does it come from? So psi dot just means the derivative of psi with respect to C. No, no, but I, my question is what. Ah, uh, here. Yes. Oh, yes, sorry. Uh, so this corresponds to here. Okay, so this is, this oh, is an yes. error. No, no, but this, you, you, you're, you're, very, you're very much right about that. So here, if I differentiate respect to, so here there is a prime. And here, uh, this, there is no dot, there is a prime. Okay. Like, is, does it look better like that? I think so, yeah. As a, as a corresponds to C. And then so, yeah. the second question would be on the F, so, so on the spectrum of the Hamiltonian. Yes. Um, for, of course, you, some of you forget about this F double prime. You say that your continuous spectrum starts at C. Yes. And then, so do you somehow assume, or does it follow from the assumptions, that this F double prime has a zero and it's only non-negative or something like that? Because oh, no, no, but it's, it's something, uh, you know, it's Weil's theorem which tells you that if you have a compact perturbation of a, of a self-adjoint operator, its uh, continuous spectrum is not affected. So here the continuous spectrum, as you were saying, if f is 0 is c infinity. But then this f, it's decaying quickly, and it's lower order in terms of derivatives, so it's compact. So adding it doesn't change the continuous spectrum. Okay. Mm -hmm. The one with D over DC is D over DC applied to the second line? So it's D over DC applied to 
D equation, the OD. Okay, so when you turn point on the six sides of... Oh, yeah, you're right. You're right. So okay, so it... So, okay, so now, it, thank you for this remark. So now there is no prime, and there is no prime here. And now, now we're good, I think. Okay. Uh, and ha I haven't used yet the second identity, but it's, it's going to come up uh, soon. OK, so now we're going to use using translation invariance. Um, OK, so let's say we want to minimize dx of u minus psi of x minus x naught in L2 squared plus u minus psi of x minus x naught in L2 squared. So that would be the h1 norm of u of, and so we want to minimize over x naught. That would be the um, H1 norm, right? Uh, but it turns out it's, it's a bit uh, m more simple if, if here you put um, the, the speed of the soliton, which remember has to be positive. Uh, and of course, this quantity is equivalent to the, to the H1 norm. So, okay, let's uh, admit that, that, that this, this has a minimum. This is not hard to see. Uh, then at the minimum, uh, the derivative over x naught of this whole mess is 0. And now, what is the derivative over uh, x naught? So this is, so let's differentiate this one first. So then you get the integral of dx u uh, minus psi Right, dx u minus psi against uh, d x squared psi. And if you differentiate this one, you get plus c times the integral of u minus psi times dx psi. And u minus psi, we're going to call it v. This is v. And 
I, I, I don't write it, but it's always assumed that instead of psi, you have psi of x minus x naught. Right, everywhere psi is translated by uh, x naught. Okay, so this we can write as the integral of dx cubed of psi uh, plus c dx psi uh, yes so here there is a negative sign like that so just integrable parts here against v dx right and so this is uh, by the ODE satisfied by Psi, this is F double prime of Psi times uh, Psi prime. Okay, so uh, what this means is that uh, Right, so w what this means is that, f uh, how, how do I want to explain that? Yes. So we, we want to Right, so we want to show that f of uh, u is equivalent to a constant plus the infimum of u minus psi c x minus x naught in h1 squared. Um, but actually, we would be happy with just uh, uh, this inequality uh, sorry i'm getting confused No, we want the other way around. So we want this inequality. So it would suffice to show that f of psi uh, that u can be written psi c of x minus x naught plus v and f of psi c of x minus x naught plus v ah sorry i'm having a hard time writing it in a clear way let me try again uh yeah that that that's a good point okay so let me let me do it again sorry for the confusion Okay, so what this is telling us is that 
uh, we can so we can write right so we write u equals pcc of x minus x naught plus v where x naught achieves the minimum and v is is the um, uh, by definition u minus p okay then the infimum of uh, the whole mass is just u minus it's just sorry v in h1 squared and f of u is just f of c plus v okay so now wh what is our mission is to show that f of c plus v is like a constant plus v in h1 squared plus uh, higher order terms but what we gained is that there is this uh, you know orthogonality condition under the assumption if the integral of f double prime of psi psi prime against v dx is zero. Okay, so this is this is now what we want to achieve. And in terms of the uh, uh, Schrodinger operator, you know the question remains the same, but there is this additional uh, orthogonality condition, right? And of course, you know, maybe it's another miracle, or maybe it's just that things uh, come from the structure of the equation. But this orthogonality condition will exactly cancel the uh, negative eigenvalue that we were worried about. Okay, so I think this is a more clear way to put it. Do you, do you have questions? Does it make sense? We still don't know whether this minimum exists, right? Uh, that's true, but it's, it's not so... Uh, okay, so I haven't proved it, but this is, th this, you know, uh, it's clear that if you send x naught to infinity, what you're doing is you're s sending the soliton to infinity, and then this will converge to the sum of the h1 norm of u squared plus the h1 norm of c squared. Now, uh, it's clear that if x naught on the other hand is allowed to range uh, over, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the whole real line, the, there will be some points that will fare better than uh, just the sum of the two. And so you can restrict to a, a compact set and then uh, you can find the minimum. I, I, you know, I, I agree it's, it's not a full-fledged proof, but that's the idea. Okay, so... So we, we're minimizing both over u and, uh, 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 and x naught, or, uh, or u is fixed and we're minimizing over x naught? All right, we're mi minimizing over x naught, right? At fixed u. At fixed u, yes. Right, it's trying, we're, we're trying to sort of fit u as well as possible with the, the solid term. And, and u is the solution at a given time, or it's, uh, it's Yes, or ultimately, it's going to be the solution at a given time. But now everything is just a variational problem.
OK, so where did we get? So we have f of psi c plus v. So we, we, we say this is a constant. And then there is a linear term that is 0 by construction of f. And then there is this term uh, hc v against v. And then there is a cubic term. And uh, by varying, by using the translation invariance, uh, we can assume, so we can assume that the integral of v against f double prime of psi times psi prime, this is at x minus x naught, dx equals 0. And here it's also x minus x naught, right? Uh, but once again, we can use translation invariance. And uh, proving this for a given x naught is the same as proving this for uh, x naught equals 0. So, so now the problem is to show that hcv against v is equivalent to the norm of v in h1 squared under the condition that v f double prime of psi psi prime equals dx equals 0. But now this is really a, you know, a linear algebra or a functional analysis problem. Uh, you know, you need to use some more the structure of the equation and uh, the ODE. Uh, but uh, f from now on, it's, it's, you know, a bit of a Hilbert space analysis, which I ob obviously will not have time to cover, uh, but which is uh, rather standard. And so if you, if you, go, if you go through that, uh, you get... Sorry, yeah. this is not just a Lagrange multiplier then? Uh, yeah, I mean, you, you need to use Lagrange multipliers, but uh, a number of times, and it's, it's not that straightforward. It's, it's, you know, a couple of pages. Right, yes. And, and you need to use the, the structure of the equation and the structure of the OD. Um, OK, so I, I won't have time to do it. Uh, but uh, once you cast the problem under this form, it's, uh, it's uh, amenable to classical tools. Uh, so yeah, let me conclude here. And perhaps you have uh, questions. Mm -hmm. F double prime, does it evaluate at psi? Is it also evaluated at psi of x minus x zero? Or That's right. So actually what happens is that you have x minus x naught everywhere. So here pcc is, is uh, translated. In hc, uh, the pcc that appears it's, is also translated everywhere hc is translated. Okay. Uh, and so you can just basically change coordinates to put okay. the translation on V. Okay, all right, thanks. Other questions? Well, I have a stupid question which has nothing to do with the lecture. So when, if people don't have any other questions, uh, just bring it to us mine. But let me wait on the set of tongues and tongue sweet out. <laughs> uh, yes, maybe a very stupid question from my side. No, no. Shortly recap the structure of this proof because I got a bit lost. I wanted to construct some f of u, yes. which is something like the failure of the function u to resemble its solid form. Right. And then we define this f to be a plus c m. Yes. From obvious reasons. Yes. I don't want the gradient of f to be zero at psi c. Yes. And then I think it should be resembled. Uh, 
and it actually satisfies this property, then you should be invariant under the quadratic degrees. So it's the degrees of equation and actually be something like c plus some e c one, I guess. So the one star and the two star property. Right, yes. So what was now the plan to actually get this to just establish this equality? May, may I just reword a little bit what you said? I mean, my understanding was not that that resembles this uh, minimization, but it controls the minimum. Is it not the point? Yes, so the, I, I use the, this twiddle symbol, which always means that, uh, you know, yeah, up to a multiplicative right. constant, it's the same. Yeah, you got that, yeah. Um, right, so uh, what I hope to convey is that you can reduce the problem to, to proving that. If you can prove that, it means the uh, functional that, that uh, we cooked up actually does the job. It does the job to, to second order, but then higher order terms, you can absorb them and uh, you're good. Um, and and, and the, the trick is to get this orthogonality condition in, in order to cancel the negative eigenvalue in HC. And, um, and this, this comes from using this translation invariance. Uh, I don't know if this answers your question. There was also a one star condition actually being buried under the quadratic degrees equation. Ah, yes, but this is, but this, since. Uh, because it's made of H and M, all right. That's right, yes, that's right. So that, that's in order to satisfy the f f one star condition, you just need to cook up F with uh, invariant quantities, you know, and the most simple thing is to take a linear combination of the two invariant quantities that we have. All right, yes, I see. Okay, pretty much two of my side. It's pretty obvious, yeah? I don't know, no, no, no worries, no worries. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm sure every question is helpful to many people, so, yeah. Are, are there uh, any other questions? Yes. Uh, what Ah, yes, that's right. So this, this comes when you, when you prove that, uh, this condition comes up. So physically, what does it mean? Physically, it means that small solitons in the so sense of L2 uh, travel faster. I don't know if uh, this is a satisfactory answer, but that's, <coughs> that's what it means, right? Uh, okay, I guess, Piotr, it's your turn. Uh, <laughs> Uh, ah oui, uh, et ben en fait, il faut... Uh... Ok, so let, let me first say goodbye to everybody before uh, reverting back to French. Uh, so goodbye everybody and, and see, you, see you next time. Um, so, yes, uh, Piotr, uh, donc en fait, uh, si, si tu l'espèce de petit truc de contrôle là, le petit... Il oui. y, a, y, a, y a cinq boutons en bas, uh, oui. pause icon, PowerPoint et Bildschirm. Donc c'est le, le, le petit papier avec les, les boutons carrés, c'est ça Ouais, ouais. Et, et le, les, faut, faut, moi, il fallait que j'appuie sur PowerPoint et Bildschirm. D'accord. Et ça enlève... Et, et donc ça, ça a résolu le problème. Ouais, mais c'est vrai que j'ai eu un peu peur au début, oui. <rire> et deuxième chose, le, les traceurs ne marchaient pas ce matin. Oh, ouais. Là, tu, tu l'as pris dans l'autre labo, là, ou bien tu, tu as juste... Non, en fait, je l'ai rebranché. Il y a, il y a une, il y a une prise. Tu as fait mon cours, et, euh, mais ça marche toujours pas, ça marche toujours pas quand tu es arrivé ou bien euh, Non, non. Mais là, maintenant, ça marche. Mais je crois qu'il n'était pas bien branché. Je ne sais pas si c'est toi, mais je crois qu'il n'était pas bien branché. Ok, bon. <rire> ben, non, mais ça a son importance. Hein. <rire> euh, à bientôt. <rire>